prayed this prayer in Matthew 11. O oh Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Sing that again in the shelter. In the 
God, we just thank you for the truth of those words that uh, you are the Savior who has called us uh, to himself. Um, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And that as we gather in this place, Lord, um, the sacredness of this place is because of your Holy Spirit that indwells each one of us. We just welcome you here to, um, Lord, remind our, each one of us, and Lord, help us to be reminders to one another in your presence is fullness of joy. You are the God who calls us to come to you. Those who are weary and heavily burdened and find their rest. Lord, we're here this evening to find our rest in you. And we thank you for Jesus who provides that to us. He is our shelter in every storm this world could ever throw at us. We are safe in your arms. We thank you and praise you for these things in Jesus' precious name. Just want to uh, welcome you here uh, to Forest Hill Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Bruce Hamlin, and uh, it's uh, it's good to be with you. I'm fully with you this week. I've been uh, uh, I've been on break for a little while. I've been here, but I haven't been preaching, and uh, it's uh, it's good to be back. Um, I don't know what your expectations are of having three weeks off, but bringing the word, and the word brings its own power. So praise God for that. Um, in spite of everything else that's going on in August, what we do as a church is we get ready for Christmas. <laughs> I know. It's earlier every year and this year in August. Uh, no, it's because we uh, sponsor a, uh, a church down in Belize, and it is a massive uh, undertaking that they do every single Christmas for all the kids in the villages where they live. And when the pastor was here, uh, last September, he shared his vision that he was hoping to gather together a thousand backpacks uh, for back to school uh, for s with school items for the kids of his village. A thousand backpacks. So um, some big mouth, me, uh, opened his mouth and said, you know what, put us down for 250. He should have heard the gasps in the room. But you know what? Uh, we can do this. Uh, we can do this. Stuff is already pouring in. Uh, I've been seeing boxes and stuff pour in. Uh, I think, is there a handout uh, of those things? Okay, there's no handout of those, but you can go online and uh, you can check and see what is still needed. Um, but basically that bin out there is for just small item back to school uh, things, uh, items uh, for the kids down there in the villages. And we plan on having a packing party in mid-September. And the reason we do that is they need to get shipped out early October so they get on a crate, uh, a, a container, shipping container by the end of October so they arrive in Belize by Christmas, okay? So uh, that's why we do Christmas in August in a sense. So as you're in stores, you're seeing back to school sales. If you can grab some extra rulers, some extra erasers, some uh, colored pencils, uh, pencil sharpeners, uh, pencil cases, those are always uh, much needed items. Uh, Kelly is in back, and if you all do uh, 180 with your necks, you can see Kelly back there. And she can give you every single detail about everything, because she spent this afternoon uh, inventorying everything that we have and don't have. So you can see her after the service, and she'll, she'll let you know. But we would just really appreciate your participation in this and, and helping us uh, bless the kids of, of Belize this Christmas and, and help Pastor Victor uh, down there, who's uh, one of our missionaries that we just love and so look forward to hearing uh, his updates on that.
I know many of us uh, hearing those words and, and just singing them from our hearts, we, we can attest to the fact that there truly is no one like you because many of us have tried looking in many other places to see if there was something else, if there was something better. And Lord, we're here tonight as your church to confess you are the only one. You are the only one worthy of our praise. You are the only one worthy to carry our burdens. You're the only one worthy to, uh, to call Master and Savior and King. And I pray, Lord, that you would do a reorienting work tonight in our hearts as we, as we look to your word and as we open our hearts to you, Lord, to just be fully present to the things that you have to say, to the ways in which you want to use your word to challenge and rebuke and encourage and to train. Lord, we want to, we want to be humble before you, before your word, and before the things the Holy Spirit has to say. And so, Lord, help us to take that posture here. We've gathered here under the banner of the headship of Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. 
Well, words, uh, words have power. Despite what you may have heard uh, growing up, uh, there is no denying the fact that words have power. One of the greatest lies of childhood, we've all heard it, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones. Uh, sometimes we change it to names, but if you actually go back to 1862, the first known version of this phrase, it's words will never hurt me. Greatest lie of childhood. Of course words hurt. Oftentimes words hurt worse. People try to impressed with their many words as if the number of words that they use uh, can somehow be a sign of something, their importance or their intelligence or whatever. And one of my favorite quotes, and it's disputed who first said it, whether it's Abraham Lincoln or Mark Twain or whoever, it doesn't really matter, but I love this quote. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. <laughs> I love that just because it's so true of me so often. Um, as a as a journeying pilgrim with Jesus, a follower of Jesus for uh, over 40 years now, I spent a great deal of time in and around the Bible. And uh, that's been a, an incredible blessing in my life. And one of the things that when I was young, I very much took for granted. Uh, but the older I get, the more I look back and I just thank God. I thank God for the, the hymns I grew up with, the songs that were uh, part of my life growing up. I thank God for all the times that I begrudgingly walked into Sunday school class to, re, uh, to um, recite the, the memory verse that I was told to, 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 to say. And uh, it's true that the Word is so powerful and it stays with you. It stays with us. One of the most astounding realities that I've found in my life over this 40 plus years of walking with Jesus is that no matter how many times you read it, no matter how much time you spend in God's Word, it always proves inexhaustible. Inexhaustible in its power to speak, in its power to convict, in its, in its power to shape our lives. I mean, there are verses that I memorized as a kid that didn't even hit me until decades later. And I pray that if God gives me decades more, the same would take place in my life and in my heart, that he would continue to reveal just how deep his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness are. It's no wonder that the New Testament book of Hebrews uh, writer wrote these words, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Isn't that cool? He uses spiritual imagery right along physical imagery, saying this word that we read, it can tear us up. That, 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 that's the point he's getting to. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, even going into those things that we think. The word of God is powerful. Starting today, and just, just for a few weeks as we close out summer and, and move, into a fall, move into the fall season together, I want to share with you some of the most startling revelations God has given me that revolve around one single word from one single verse. I know it sounds really weird, but sometimes there has even been just one word in one verse that God has just used so powerfully and so deeply in my life and as if to almost kind of demonstrate to you the power of God's word if you don't know it firsthand for yourself to show you how God can even take a word and pull back the curtain on that word and show you so much of who he is and how much he loves you and how desperately he wants to be in relationship and walk with you and me through this journey of life. So if you never thought a pastor could preach a one word sermon you're about to be proven wrong. There's more I have to say about that one word, but it is one word. So the title of tonight's message is that. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm sure you were thinking of, like, it's got to be an interesting word, like sin or repentance or heaven or something like that. Nope. We're going to look at the word that. If you have trouble sleeping, look up the word that in the dictionary. Um, 
you can ask yourself, well, does he mean the word that as a pronoun or that as an adjective, that as an adverb? I'm going to spare you the grammar lesson, and I'm just going to say, for the context of today's verse, I mean that, in, I mean that, that in the uh, adjective form. Used to indicate, here's a definition, indicate a person, place, thing, or degree as indicated or mentioned before. Okay, so that's the, that's the, 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 the form of the word that uh, that we're going to be looking at, uh, used as a, uh, an adjective to indicate uh, a degree of something that has been mentioned before. Okay, now here's the verse that I'm going to use to unpack this word that. It comes from Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 12. This is Paul writing uh, to the church in Philippi, and he says, he writes these words down. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. As I said, this is one of those verses that I, I heard early on. Uh, Philippians itself, it seems like it's a verse that pastors love to preach uh, through the book of Philippians all the time. There's, there's constantly the book of Philippians going on somewhere, right? It's a fantastic book. It's so dense, has so many amazing um, uh, pictures for us as to who God is and his great love for us. Uh, so many amazing verses. But this verse in particular, it wasn't that long ago that I was reflecting on this verse. And again, when you've hidden scripture in your heart, God can pull those things out of the Rolodex of your spirit and say, here's the verse I want you to be thinking about, okay? If your mind and your heart, your spirit is all cluttered with um, other things, baseball statistics, movie quotes, song lyrics, whatever, you know what, make some room for the word of God because when life gets hard and situations arise and the Holy Spirit comes and opens up the file cabinet of things to use, you know, you don't want them doing this too long, junk, 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 junk. You want to be able to go, here it is. This is what I have for you. This is what I want you to, to meditate on and think about. And this is true of this verse. And I was thinking about what Paul is saying. Not that I've already obtained all this or I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that, that person, place, or thing, that thing he's trying to describe, but he only uses the word that to do it, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And it spun me out, this verse just spun me out, think, what is the that, okay? Sometimes this is going to sound like a who's on first thing, I don't mean it to be that, okay? Because uh, the word is that, and it, I'm going to be using it in a lot of other ways, I'll try to identify when I'm doing that, but Paul doesn't say what the that is, he just says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In truth, there's really two key words that are connected here not to make this worse, but this and that, okay? Uh, because <laughs> Paul actually is talking about this. To unpack the that, we do have to go back and unpack the this, okay? So Paul is just finished. If you go back, and you always have to go back to understand the context of the verse, if you want to really understand what it's trying to say. <coughs> and what Paul is doing, he's just finished arguing that if you want to try and compare spiritual resumes, Paul lays out his spiritual resume earlier in chapter 3 of Philippians. And basically, you don't want to compare resumes with Paul when it comes to religious stuff, okay? We don't measure up to what Paul had, was bringing to the table in his day, in his age, in terms of spiritual resumes. Paul had a lot going for him, okay? Paul was applying to any position in any religious organization and showed his resume. The people would have been like, listen, you shouldn't work here. You should run here. You should be the president of here, Okay? Uh, that, that's what Paul was coming with. Paul, Paul was coming into this with a double PhD in all things religious. Basically, what he was saying, again, earlier in Philippians chapter 3, what he was saying is that he had invested his entire life into trying to pursue God. And he was laying that out for the people. He's saying, listen, the family I was born into, the teachers I had, the ways in which I just immersed myself in religious tradition, I was just ardent and striving to live the most religious life I possibly could. And he succeeded. And then Paul steps back, and he looks at his life resume, 
And he looks at all that he'd done, and he'd laid that all out, all that out there for the church in Philippi. All that he had done, all the ways that he had worked uh, to try to know and please God. And this is what he says: "It's all garbage. It's all garbage." This is where our NIVs really make it sound a whole lot more pal- palatable than Paul cared to be. Okay? He uses a Greek word, uh, skubalon, which means excrement. That's what Paul's talking about. Paul says, everything that I did to be religious, it's all excrement to me. Can you imagine? It's in the Bible, folks. Paul says, pursuing religion was a total waste of time. I know some of you are like, are we in church? Where, where is this? What, you know, that's not what a, what a pastor is supposed to be saying. This is the word of God, and this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, everything that I could do to pursue this God, I did, and I'm stepping back from it now, and I'm looking at it, and I realize everything that I did was futile, a waste of time, junk. And then he says this, here's what matters, knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus, because here's the reality, you can look at any religious system in the world and study it and look into it and it will tell you the same thing again and again and again, here's what you need to do in order to find God, do this, pray this, Uh, Do a pilgrimage here, give this, memorize this, attain this level of enlightenment, and you will will achieve perfection, oneness with the universe, or the deity himself, or you will become that deity. You just have to do these things. Among all world religions, among them, Christianity stands out by saying this, we have a God who came to come and find us. God says, here I am, come to find you. It is not about what you do to come and find me. Paul says, everything that I did to try to find him was a total waste of time because all the while, he was looking for me. Then we come to uh, Philippians 3.10. It's a verse that I've claimed as my life verse for over 30 years now. I pray it all the time. It's, It's a verse that is so near and dear to my heart. Paul just, he builds this whole thing. I pursued God with all this religious fervor. It added to nothing. It was all junk. But now here's what I want, Paul says in Philippians 3.10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I don't like this next part, but it's part of the verse. And share in the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. What is the culmination of everything Paul's looking for? I want to know Christ because he is God who has come to find me. And so maybe at this point, you're ready to say, well, thanks a lot, Paul, okay? Uh, You already had the greatest religious resume in the world, felt bad enough, and then you said, you know what, that was all junk, so you threw all that away, and then you rub it into our faces that now your heart is consumed with knowing this Jesus. Paul, you're consumed with this Jesus, and if we're honest, if you're honest, okay, you and I would say, you know what, that's not me either. Well, maybe I won't speak for you. I'll speak for me. The pastor of Forest Dale Church is telling you, I don't pursue God with my whole heart all the time the way that I know I should. I don't love Jesus to the depth that I know I should. I don't hunger for him in the way that I know I need to. And here's the beauty in this. Please don't miss what Paul says here, okay? Here's the beauty in this. If you're sitting there thinking, you know what? I don't love Jesus like I should. I don't know Jesus like I should. I don't feel like I'm adequate to this task. Look what Paul says. Not that I've already obtained all this. (laughs) That baby's saying hallelujah in baby voice, okay? (laughs) Absolutely. That's a hallelujah moment. If Shirley was here, she'd say it for us. Hallelujah. Paul says, I'm not there yet either. 
I have not become perfect yet either. I don't have it all together either. Guys, I'm not there. I haven't obtained all this. I'm not perfect at all. But here's what I do. And this is where we get to the that, okay? This, is a, this was everything to describe to this. Now we get to that. I haven't obtained all this. I'm not perfect at all. Here's what I do. Here's the point of my life. Here's how I live. No, I'm far from perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In that simple statement, Paul sums up his life. And herein, I believe, lies the power of this verse that made it burst alive uh, to me. See, the context of the verse tells us what this is, but it's the context of Paul's life that tells us what that is. Do you see the difference? You can, to find out what this is, not that I've already obtained all this, just go back a few verses, you'll figure out what this is. But the that, you have to take a look and see how did Paul live his life. That's the power of that. And by using the words pressing on to take hold of that, Paul is talking about an ongoing, active pursuit. A theologian, N.T. Wright, uh, wrote these words about what Paul is saying here, saying that Paul, what Paul's talking about here is growing up, maturing, just growing in our faith, growing in our walk with the Lord, making sure it's not just a one-way relationship, but it's a two-way relationship, and that we're seeking Him with our whole heart. N.T. Wright says this, what Paul is talking about here is maturity, and what he actually means is, means is knowing that you haven't arrived and that you must still keep pressing forward towards the goal. You know, one of the great struggles of the church is we come off to people like we're there. We come off to people like we've already arrived, we've got it all together, we've somehow attained perfection, and we're just marking time until Jesus comes back and takes us home, and good luck to all you. You know what the vital church is? The church that says, I haven't obtained it, but I'm pressing on. Hey, do you want to press on with me? Do you want to journey with me? God is working on me, and he's chipping away those rough edges, and it hurts, but I want you to know I'm not all there. God is still powerfully at work in me. That. Paul's use of the word that is the unique God-ordained purpose for which God purposefully and intentionally put you on this earth. Listen to Paul's own words inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's going to describe the that a little bit more without telling us exactly what it is, okay? But he goes on in the next couple of verses and says, Brothers, I, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. It is that, okay? But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, straining toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's another, that's six sermons, okay? Right in there, all right? This whole idea of, you know what the number one struggle for most Christians is? They keep looking back. And what they see behind them is ruling where they're going to go in front of them. And it shackles them. Paul says, no, no, no. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to forget what's behind. You know why? Because my God has forgotten what is behind. Because he says when he forgives us, he cleanses us, and he removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Why am I clinging to that? I'm never going to get to that unless I let go of all that junk. Look again at the verse. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Grant me the liberty now to, to, to just tweak this and that for our better understanding here, okay? You can, you can look at these words and just fill them in with other words now that we've kind of done a little work to, to, to unpack this, okay? Not that I have already obtained all this, 
meaning all of the implications of what it means to be in a love relationship with this Jesus. I have not unpacked the immensity of all that that means, knowing this Jesus. Not that I've already obtained all this. But I press on to take hold of that. And here's what we can fill in for that. Everything God has given me and made me to be, and in turning those things back on Him to show Him off, to bring glory to His name, to declare the, myri- the mysterious power of His love and His grace and His mercy and His faithfulness. I press on to take hold of everything God has instilled in me to use for His glory. That's Paul's that. I press on to take hold of that. And here's the key takeaway. I'm going to close with these couple of thoughts here. What's your that? What's your that? See, here's the thing. Paul's that isn't your that. There may be shadows and similarities between it. Yes, we're all called to go and make disciples. Yes, we're all called to to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yes, we're all called to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. But in the practical outworking of it, Paul's that isn't your that. Your that isn't my that. Each of us have been uniquely designed by God to bring glory to Him in the unique way in which He created us. Yes, there are similarities. They will all bring honor and glory to the name of God, but they may not all look exactly the same. And that's the beauty of it. And there again is another trap in the church. Sometimes we say, oh, I got to do what he's doing. Or I'm supposed to do what this person, oh, she's, oh, she's got to be super spiritual, uh, so I, I have to do what she's doing. I have to read what she's reading. You know, discipleship, yes, there's a training process and there is a, a, a tutoring and a mentoring that can go on uh, for a season, for a time, but that's not so that a different person can, dis- can displace the Holy Spirit in your life. That's to enliven you to your that. What it is that you press on to take hold of. Because Christ Jesus took hold of you for that very reason and that very purpose, that you might display that very gift in your life, through your life. What is your that? And are you pressing toward it? Here's the beauty and the majesty behind this word that. Your that is going to be unique to you. It's going to look different. Your your everything for the glory of God is going to be look a little bit different than my all for the glory of God. There's a woman in our in our church family. Uh, she she's not with us right now. She's elderly, and because of her uh, situation, she she needs to really remain isolated. And uh, but hardly a week goes by that I don't talk to her. And w- inevitably, one of the conversations within the conversation, at some point it turns, because she has to bring up her that. And she says, Pastor, here I am in this house by myself. What's my prayer assignment? Give me my prayer assignment. I wish I could come and clean that church. I wish I could come and be part of a greeting ministry. I wish I could be part of uh, of working with the kids. I'm not in that season of life. This is my that. Tell me how I need to be praying. I've been praying for this. What's happening with that, Pastor? (laughs) What's she doing? She's doing her that. There's a man in our church family, and his that is visitation. Something happens in his life and in his spirit and the countenance on his face when he goes and visits elderly people, and he's got a gift with them, and they love him, and he takes time out of his schedule to go and sit with them and listen to them and love them. And it is a blessing. And God sees that and it honors him. Why? Because it's part of his that. There's a woman, part of our church, who's set up her life to minister to hurting moms. Moms who find themselves in trouble, pregnant, didn't plan on it, don't have resources. Why? It's part of her that. For me, it's teaching. 
I, I went to seminary not to be a pastor. That's God, God's grand sense of humor. <coughs> Every class that I took when I went to seminary for the first time back in 1997, I went to teach. Why? Because it's my that. I can't imagine doing other things. It's why I love spending time at Trinity Christian Academy. It's why I love what I do here. Yeah, it's, you can call it preaching if you want, but in my heart, God made me to be a teacher. Here's what your that is. You want to know what your that is? Your that is, is this. Woe is me if I don't love God by dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Woe is me. I don't know what I would do because this knowing Jesus has so bubbled up in my life, I don't know, I don't know what I would do if I couldn't dot, dot, dot. And that's the question. What's your dot, dot, dot? <laughs> Can I just challenge you as I close? If you don't know what that is, if you don't know what your dot, dot, dot is, if you don't know what your that is that you press on to take hold of, you need to go back to the beginning of this section. Back to where Paul talks about his heart's desire and that his heart's desire is to know Jesus. That's, this is going to be a horrible sentence, that's where your that comes from. It's born out of a love relationship, a two-way interrelationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. And if you don't know what your that is, if you don't know what you're pressing on to take hold of, that very thing that God uniquely designed you to do on this earth to bring Him glory and honor and to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ, you need to go back to Philippians 3.10 where Paul comes to the point of saying, listen, all of my life pursuits add to nothing. Here's what it's about. I want to know Christ. I want to know Jesus. And you might be sitting there thinking, but I do it so poorly. I do it so badly. I'm so hot and cold. Come back tonight and say, Jesus, renew that spirit in me that says, I want to know you. I want you to be preeminent above everything else in my life. I want to know you. I want to know your power. And I recognize that that means sometimes that I'm going to be sharing in sufferings, but you know what? That's what it means to know you. Jesus, I want to know you. You have been so faithful. You have been so gracious. You've even allowed me to come and just hear this, this word wash over me. Help me to respond to what you're saying. Would you just bow with me in a, in a moment of prayer? Father, I want to pray for everyone who's hearing this message, everyone who's watching this message. Lord, there is power in your word. And Father, tonight as we've reflected on your word, may the power of your Holy Spirit work powerfully in and through us that we might settle for nothing less than your perfect plan worked out in and through our lives, that we might bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus. And if there's anyone listening to this message, even right now, that says, I don't even know where to begin, may they begin by coming to you, Father, in prayer and saying, I need this Jesus in my life. I need his forgiveness. I need his new start. I need that yoke that is easy and that burden that is light because I've been trying to carry too many and they're too heavy and they're wearing me out. Father, for all those burned out on religion and burned out on trying to do enough to please you, may they fall into the arms of grace. May they come to know how good, how awesome, how loving and how tender is God, their Savior, and Jesus Christ. As we continue and close our time together in a time of worship, Father, whether we sing these songs or not, may the sentiment of your goodness and your faithfulness and your love toward us, may that overflow in our hearts. So we pray these things in Jesus' precious name.
With my life laid down 